just a uh, little bit of a clarification i mean when we talk about the india's uh, history of banking globally it's i mean it's not 200 years it's probably a, a few thousand years but when i was researching for the book on the sbi the state bank of india i had discovered that uh, it was in the last 200 years that there has been a more formal attempt at banking in india and which is why we mentioned the 200 year history but actually if you look at banking itself it goes back to probably i didn't do extensive research on that but it is probably going back to 2000 bc so it's it's more than uh, uh, 2000 years that we see banking just to begin with you know when we talk about banking uh, a bank has uh, two aspects it's very simple actually the, the the whole aspect of banking is very simple that you're borrowing money from somewhere either it's your own money as a capital or you're borrowing from uh, depositors and you're lending money to somebody else and the difference in the interest rates what you pay the depositor and what you earn from the uh, lender I, I mean to the person to whom you lend is what the banking makes money all about so it in in reality it's a very simple concept to explain but surprisingly most banks do not succeed they fail so that's a topic for some other day we're not getting into how banks work I'm I'm trying to focus on uh, as a as a historian as a researcher I'm trying to understand how banks have evolved in India and which is what we'll try to cover today. Coming back to this history about two thousand years, I mean, for a large period up to the formal banks coming into India, probably in the nineteenth century, you find that the bankers were essentially only lenders. They were not borrowing money from the common man and giving interest on the deposits paid, deposits with the bank. They were essentially lenders, money lenders, who sort of acted as bankers because you need somebody to go down to if you are to borrow money. So it is from Vedic period, you find that mentioned in the Jataka tales, the, there is a Sanskrit word called rin or debt, which is what the origin of uh, you know banking in India is all about. That I have a rin from somebody and Essentially, the bankers were just lenders. Even, and many of you might have read Artha Shastra, it gives during Chanakya's reign, and this was uh, almost around 250 BC, you find mention in great detail about how the treasury should operate. And there were different rules set up for banking. For, I, I picked up one rule, which was very interesting, that if a husband has borrowed money from somebody and he dies, the wife is not liable to pay. But if the wife had borrowed money or if any, any member of the family has borrowed money, then the husband who is considered the karta dharta of the family is expected to find ways to return the loan he has taken. He has to repay the debt. So these are some interesting rules and many such rules which were set up in Artha Shastra during Chanakya's time. A little bit of, uh, you know, while I was researching, I found some interesting uh, points on, on currency and I just wanted to share that with you. The currency is a completely different topic. I'm not getting into details of how, I mean, a simple question you could ask an economic student is to explain how government prints money and most people would not be able to answer that properly as to why and how government prints money. But coming back to the topic of currency, I I realized that there were these terms which we use very colloquially or casually in our conversation. You know, a footy kodi bhi nahi milegi. So the cowrie shells, which were the seashells, were essentially used as currency to exchange even before the gold coins or the silver coins. And though they themselves came about many, many centuries back. But a footy cowrie, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the footy cowrie also had a value. So three footy cowries made one cowrie. And we also talk about, you know, saying ki, Chamdi jaya par damdi na jaya. There was a, there was a thing about the, what is a damdi, and two damdis made one dhela, and two dhelas made a paisa. So it is very interesting that uh, the whole concept which we use so colloquially in our in our conversation even today goes back to some of these which are no more present. Even the anas are not present. Sola ane bhav. We used to say 16, one rupee is made up of 16 anas. And we still call it an athanna, athanni or a chavanni. Though I think those uh, coins are no more in existence, the 25 paisa and the 50 paisa coins. 
so those were some of the interesting things i found which were uh, you know dhela bhi nahi milega so but that is the value because a few hundred years back that currency carried value because that is the kind of inflation which was there in the country then that even 1/10th of a paisa a kaudi is a very small part of a paisa still had value because it could be exchanged for getting something in return so that's just an aside on on currency uh coming back to banking and how and and i found it difficult to pinpoint as to which was the formal year in which we saw banks emerging in india there's a reference as early as and everything starts around the british east india company before that they were only bankers they were uh, uh, to bankers to the mughal empire bankers to the peshwas to the maratha empire who were more like sahukars it was in 1683 that there was the first attempt made by the officers of the british east india company to set up a a bank and 1683 just for you for some of you to understand the context uh, is 1680 is the year in which shivaji died so it was as early as that time there there's an attempt made but nothing is available around that time it was the same time that you find globally that the concept of banking comes up and many of you who are interested you know there is a neil ferguson who is a very eminent historian has written a book called the house of rothschild even today the rothschild family is one of the most secretive most influential and one of the wealthiest families in the world and they owe their origin to the banking which they started uh, a few centuries ago and uh, you know it was the mayor rothschild one of the founders of the rothschild family had paid money to britain or used to get money from britain for supplying mercenary soldiers and apparently uh, in neil ferguson's book also it's mentioned that they one of the rothschild family members speculated on the british bonds during the war of waterloo in 1815 and that was a turn around for the family and they made a lot of uh, made a fortune out of that but this whole the the term bank itself is is apparently an italian term which means uh, you know they used to use a term called banca rota or for somebody who has become bankrupt because the lenders used to sit on wooden benches and if they had no money to pay they'd become bankrupt the bench would actually be broken and that is the where the, the term bankruptcy came into uh, play so these are some of the tidbits i'm just picking up because i thought that as a as a topic about the history of banking these are uh, some of the interesting points it was in that period only during the time the rothschild was were setting up that in 1694 that we find that the bank of england was set up as a joint stock company which means that it was one of the old one of the earliest concept of a limited liability most of you would understand the concept of a limited liability and this was a joint stock company which bank of england was set up primarily to create funds for the british empire to go and fight battles and capture whatever territory they could worldwide so this was essentially to raise funds to wage war against france at which it actually began the battle of waterloo and then it went on to expand as the british empire expanded and you find the the british east india company having already set up as a trading house it was not a british empire the british empire came much later we'll talk about that but of the british east india company which had set up its operations in india and they had spoken to the mughal emperor shah jahan and others and it is at that point in time we find a lot of gujarati and i'm i'm talking about gujarat because i had done some uh, uh, i met some people and got some ideas about bankers to the mughal empire and it was interesting that one of the bankers actually refused a loan to shah jahan saying that i don't want to take a royal debt because there is a possibility that if that defaults then my whole credibility will be at loss so it was interesting to see that the bankers at that point in time had that sort of a courage to be independent you know even today there is a hari bhakti family in gujarat which owes its origins to having lent money to the peshwas in the 17th and 18th century 
there were bankers who have funded the Dilwara temple. I don't know how many of you have visited the uh, Dilwara temples in Mount Abu. They are fabulous pieces of architecture. And it was done because a Gujarati banker from Ahmedabad was willing to fund Jain bankers who were willing to lend money to build the Dilwara temple. So those were, there's a very interesting story and some of you can Google that of Jagat Seth, who was an extremely powerful and influential banker in during Aurangzeb's time in Bengal. In fact, I was reading somewhere that at that point in time, and this was uh, almost around uh, the late 17th century, around 1680 or 1700, early 1700, that his wealth was estimated to be around 14 crores. So you can imagine what that wealth would be uh, in uh, in today's times. Those some of the uh, some of the bankers or largely money lenders, formal money lenders who existed in India during the Mughal Peshwas and coexisting with the British East India Company. But the British East India Company was now trying to set up its own formal system because as you would have read in many uh, William Dalimple and many other books, you would find that the officers of the East India Company, large majority of them were extremely corrupt and their entire idea was to make money from India and repatriate that wealth back to England. And for that, they needed a formal banking mechanism by which they can send the money back home. Because the whole idea was come to India, loot it, and go back and enjoy life in uh, in uh, uh, Great Britain. Now, it, during that time, a lot of banyas, you know, in Calcutta, which were banyans, actually they were called, they were the agents. And the Marwadis, by nature, were very adept at transactions, money, currency lending. And a lot of, you find, you know, today, you, a lot of these surnames which are there in Punjab as well as in, in Calcutta, like the Podars, the Aroras, the Khatris, and all the Marwadi clans, uh, in, uh, in especially in Kolkata. And I'm talking about Kolkata because Kolkata was a capital. Uh, many of you may not probably uh, realize, but from 1772 till almost 1911, Kolkata was the capital for the British East India Company and also then for the British Empire. It was only in 1911, just 30 years before India got independence, that actually the capital moved to Delhi, now New Delhi. So Kolkata was a very important uh, part and we find in my research also, I found that the first formal bank which was set up by the British East India Company was the Bank of Bengal which was set up in 1806. So at that point in time, the British East India Company was divided into three administrative zones for the purpose of managing a, such a large, it's a trading house, mind you. It is, they are ruling India through trading and their tie-ups with local powers to be. So there was Bengal, there was Bombay, which was not called Mumbai then, and Madras. So it was in these three presidency, as they were called the presidencies of Bombay, Madras and Kolkata, Calcutta, that the three presidency banks were set up. And the first one, the Bank of Bengal, was set up in 1806, which was followed by the Bank of Madras in 1843 and the Bank of Bombay a little earlier in 1840. So you find the three presidency banks coming into play and they were the ones who are now responsible for, they were collecting some deposits also, but the they were not really encouraging savings because their, their idea was not really to encourage thrift, which came much later on after independence, after the SBI was set up, to encourage thrift in Indian citizens. And that was not never the idea for the British East India Company. They're essentially there for lending. And it was very interesting because when I was doing my research for the State Bank of India, and uh, this was the book I wrote called the SBI story, Two Centuries of Banking. I actually visited the SBI museum and those of you who visit Calcutta or some of you if you are in Calcutta, please do visit the State Bank of India museum on one strand road, which is the local head office for SBI. It's a fabulous museum. I mean, the quality of display and the ambience is equivalent to a European museum you'd find uh, in, in one of these, you know, in Paris or Amsterdam, where it's, it's just fascinating. And you have a big statue of Prince Dwarthana Tagore, who was the great, uh, who was the grandfather of Ravindra Tagore, who was one of the very early depositors as well as a borrower from the Bank of Bengal. So it is a Bank of Bengal, which I believe 
is the origin for formal banking in India, which is 1806. In the meanwhile, a lot of things are happening in, uh, in India. Now, I mean, mind you, 1806 is the time when the Maratha Empire is as it, at its peak. And there are these Anglo-Maratha wars which took place. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Shahu Bajirao Peshwa is dead after Shivaji. And the subsequent Peshwas, while they captured from almost at one point in time in the early, in the late, uh, almost around 1700s, late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, 1800s, sorry. They had captured from almost from, they used to call it from Atak to Katak, from Atok near Peshawar till Katak in the south. The Maratha Empire ruled. But the British East India Company is slowly coming up and they are becoming more and more and more powerful. And by the time the third Maratha, Anglo Maratha, what took place in 1811, there is no power which is able to defend itself and the East India Company is becoming very powerful. A little bit of history again for some of you to understand that the 1857 was a turning point. Many people do not realize that 1857 was not just a turning point in terms of the first war of independence as what the British has called the Sepoy Mutiny. But it was an uprising. But more than the uprising, it was then that the British Empire really realized that we need to now formally take over the administration of the Indian subcontinent. And that was the time the power shifted from the British East India Company into the hands of the British Empire. And then you have a governor general who comes in. And subsequently, then you find a lot of governor generals who are or the viceroys who then are ruling India. And they, the common saying used to be that the power the viceroy held was probably more than the Queen of England herself. Now I find the Bank of Bengal, Bank of Madras, and Bank of Kolkata are the three banks which are coming up. And it is as early as the late or mid 1850s to early 1900 that Bombay is very quickly overtaking Kolkata and Madras. In fact, Madras is lagging behind. Kolkata still has a lot of jute mills, tea gardens, businesses from opium. And I don't know if many of you have read the Ibis trilogy from Amitav Ghosh. I will strongly recommend you to read that. It has a fascinating uh, story about how the opium trade was being done. And the advantage the Bombay Parsis and other businessmen had was the fact that the opium from Malwa, which was under the Sindhya rule, while the Sindhyas were technically under the Britishers, the opium cultivation was not controlled by the Britishers. So the Malwa opium was still easily available to the Parsi traders from Mumbai, who then set up shops in Hong Kong, and there was a huge trade, and that's a completely different story, and I would recommend you, in fact, Amitav Ghosh has also written a book, recent book, on the whole journey of opium itself, and it's a fascinating read, and I would strongly recommend all of you, uh, or many of you who are interested in history, uh, to, to read that. It's called Smoke, Ashes, and Fire, uh, while the Ibis trilogy of Amitav Ghosh is more of a fictional story with a lot of historical uh, real events uh, put together. But coming back to the point, Bombay and the Parsis, and again, this is a fascinating story, and I know many of you who are from Bombay would be aware of how the Parsis have played a tremendous role in Mumbai coming up, textile mills, while jute on one side in Calcutta, but here now with railways coming up, the cotton supply from Gujarat, Maharashtra, and MP, the textile boom was taking place. And at one point in time, this was called the Manchester of the East, Mumbai, and the, the, there's a story about the cotton speculation as to how during the World War II, the supply of uh, cotton from America to England was stopped and B Bombay came up in a big way and then there was a crash because after the World War got over. So those are very interesting aspects of history. But those led to a tremendous growth for Mumbai and the Bank of Bombay became the biggest of the banks. It went through its ups and downs and I, I mentioned that in my book in great detail, but that's not really the part of a story. To understand how banking was now really evolving uh, into a very formal affair. As I mentioned, the 1857 was a turning point and uh, a little bit of uh, how the presidency banks were treating its employees. I had mentioned that in my note to, uh, to Khaki Lab, that it's, it's amazing. 
I mean, you know, mind you, look at the year somewhere around 1840 or 1850. It's almost 200 years before today's date. What is called as the treasurer or the secretary of the bank, which is the equivalent of the CEO of the Bank of Bengal or a CEO of a company today, had a humongous salary of 6,000 rupees per month. And the comparison is that an ordinary clerk, which is where an Indian Babu used to be appointed in the bank, had a salary of 5 rupees per month. Or 5 rupees per month. So you can imagine... Uh, you know the difference in an apprentice, which typically was a Britisher, and there would be some Indian apprentices, but largely uh, uh, some Gora, or at least, or if if not an Anglo-Indian, would be paid between 18 to 40 rupees per month. And here, uh, the secretary is almost living the life, uh, you know, richer than a king, getting 6,000 rupees uh, per month. So that's the kind of differences you see and there used to be, they, it was very clear that the banks were not meant for a common man. They had, in 1870, 1880, they had a rupee denomination, a bank note of 1000 rupees. You can imagine how many traders or businessmen could think of exchanging money of thousands of rupees when a clerk is earning a 5 rupee salary. So very clearly the banks were meant for dealing only with people like Rabindra Tagore, Prince Dwarkana Tagore, the, the various kings. Uh, so they, they, and the elite East India Company officers who were minting money, running side businesses. In Kolkata, they used to have something called a Dubashi, uh, which was a person who could speak two languages because most people in Kolkata knew English. And they became very powerful because they could interact with the, their European masters and make a lot of money. So agencies thrived and they were called agencies because they were dealing with the Indian counterpart and acting as agents for the British or the European uh, members of the of, uh, of East India Company and in the process making money while the Indian businessman was really left largely high and dry. It is in this period that's very interesting and we are now talking about the late 1800s and early 1900s that the Swadeshi movement from Calcutta and you find and th those of you who are, who are uh, reading a lot of history would know how the entire Swadeshi movement, Gandhiji now having come back from South Africa, Lokmanya Tilak, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the whole concept of the clamor for freedom has started to gain ground. And at that point in time, even today, there are companies in Calcutta. I, I don't know how many of you have used the cantharidine oil, but the Bengal Chemicals was a company which was set up and it is still existing more than 100 years later. A lot of Swadeshi movement meant the Tata Steel had come up, some of the Birla companies had come up. So they were now, there was a clamor for Indian businesses to come up and stand on its own. And quite naturally, the banks too at that point in time, started coming up. So Lala Lashwat Rai, for example, set up what is called as the Punjab and Sindh Bank. There was a Nidungadi Bank, which is now, I think it, is, it has been acquired by Punjab National Bank, was set up in 1899 in Kerala. The South Indian Bank came up in 1903. The Canada Bank was set up by a group of businessmen from Mangalore, and that came up in 1906. The, uh, the Bank of Baroda, and I am from Baroda, was set up by Maharaja Sayaj Rao Gaikwad, in 1908. At that point in time, you also find a lot of these, what we would talk about a little bit later, that what were later on called the State Bank of Patiala, State Bank of Mysore, State Bank of, uh, uh, you know, the various uh, Bank of Bikaner and Jaipur. These were originally banks which were set up by the royals in that particular state to manage the finances of their own state. They later on became state banks and then they later on were merged with State Bank of India. But that's, that's, we'll come to that a little later. So we find that these Swadeshi movement, a lot of these banks are now started coming up. Now at that point in time, the uh, Br British government realized that they were not having efficiency in terms of running the three presidency banks, the Bank of Bengal, Bank of Bombay and Bank of Madras. 
and they merged the three banks in 1921 to what are then called the Imperial Bank of India. And surprisingly, Imperial Bank of India continued for eight years after independence till 1955, when it was then nationalized to form the State Bank of India. And you can imagine that as is the case today as well, there was a lot of clamor against nationalization. I mean, you, including JRD Data who had suffered because in a, a couple of years in 1953, his pet project, Air India, had been nationalized by, by the then government. And JRD Tata was totally against nationalization of an imperial bank because he believed that this was a bank which was doing very well. But at that point in time, it was you have to understand that India, now having become independent, needed a strong pan-India bank. And Imperial Bank had a few hundred offices, some 450 offices or something like that. We needed thousands and thousands of branches. We needed a bank which could go and lend money to farmers, to small and medium enterprises, to MSMEs, to businesses which are coming up. We needed a bank which was not looking at each branch as a profitable profit center but was willing to subsidize a particular branch because it was giving money and doing good for the economy. So if you consider all of these at that point in time in 1955, the justification for nationalizing Imperial Bank of India seems absolutely correct. And this is the time the SBI, the State Bank of India was formed. And to its credit, State Bank of India continues to be India's largest bank. I think the last, I know, they probably have some 25,000 branches, which is, I think the, the nearest one, HDFC, probably has around eight or eight and a half thousand branches. So it was after independence that the clamor for nationalization began and we find SBI coming up. Now there's an interesting side story about Indira Gandhi. And I, I was happy to, I was lucky to meet uh, Dr. D.N. Ghosh, who was then the undersecretary and minister of finance, who was responsible for what was then called the nationalization of 14 private banks. Allahabad Bank, Canada Bank, United Bank, Yuko Bank, Syndicate Bank. I'm just reading out a list for some of you to understand. Indian Overseas Bank, the Punjab National Bank, Bank of India, Bank of Maharashtra, Central Bank of India, Indian Bank, Dina Bank, and Union Bank. These banks were all private banks, mind you, in 1969. And on July 19th, Indira Gandhi came up with a sudden law which was announced overnight. And all these banks who had a who had a reserves of more than 50 crores. I think the only bank which just managed to escape then was Greenlays Bank. Otherwise, Greenlays also would have been nationalized. But Greenlays escaped that and Greenlays continues to... Greenlays and there's this history about Greenlay ANC going out of India and then coming back again or trying to come back to India again now in a, in a different form. But these 14 banks were nationalized and I met D.N. Ghosh and it was... He had written a paper 50 years after the nationalization in 2019 about whether the nationalization of those banks, and again, the he said that post facto, I think the nationalization of these banks made a lot of sense because again, there was a very strong impetus in 1969, which is not too many years after independence, to make these banks go and do their social, social, not social welfare, but fulfilling their social uh, needs, which was, which was required for Indian economy to really come up to its uh, scale. And we see that happening even today. It was in 1980, again, just to give you a little bit of sense of history, that we find the nationalization of six more banks. Most people do not realize that till, till 1980, Vijaya Bank, Punjab and Sindh Bank, Oriental Bank of Commerce, the New Bank of India, which was then merged with SBI later on, Corporation Bank and Andhra Bank were also nationalized. Now, there was also a side story of this there were associate banks of State Bank of Saurashtra, Bikaner and Jaipur, Travancore, Patiala, Hyderabad, Mysore, and Indore. And as I mentioned, these are all banks which were largely started by the royal families of Indore or Patiala or uh, as a, Bank of Baroda was called as a separate Bank of Baroda itself. But these banks were operating as nationalized banks, but they were independent banks. State Bank of Bikaner and Jaipur, and they were all merged later on as associate banks of SBI to become SBI itself. So now none of these exist as independent banks. They are all the State Bank of India. 
we don't realize and some of us who just graduated uh, 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 in in the year in the early 90s was the time the first time in india that the rbi came up with rules for allowing private banks to operate in india as a as a new bank not the private banks like nedungadi bank which set up in 1899 or a vijaya bank or a bank canara bank but new banks i think the rule continues even today that rbi is not allowing a industrial group to set up a bank because they believe that there can be a lot of internal conflicts in terms of the bank lending money to the industrial house of sets it up but that was the time the first bank in 1994 was the uti bank and and the indusind bank and very quickly it was followed up by hdfc in 1994 in icici bank which will became from icici limited which existed earlier and then after a long gap you find kotak bank ratnakar uh, uh, i mean yes bank coming up in 2003 and 2004 nothing has happened after that and very surprisingly over the last 15 to 20 years you see different kinds of banks coming up but not the kind of bank like hdfc or icici so as of march 23 i was reading somewhere that there are 21 private banks 12 psu banks and 12 what is called as the small finance banks which are the licenses given by sbi later on with a explicit purpose of there are more than 740 microfinance companies in india the microfinance companies in india and today many of them have become small finance banks and that is helping a different set of uh, creditors and borrowers to to survive and thrive and small businesses to come up so you know if you look at the indian banking scenario with 140 crore population with 800 districts and 19000 pin codes even today when sbi with 23000 branches and hdfc way below with 8000 and icici with around 6000 or access bank with 5000 branches and these are the three top three banks in india there is still a long way to go so india and i don't know if uh, if any of you have read drama bijapurkar's book called lilliput india we talks about multiple indias which exist within india itself so while on one hand we are going with apps and digital and fintech there is still a very large population of india and the recent prime minister jandan yojana of creating so many bank accounts and so many microfinance companies working in india still shows that there is such a huge gap between the haves and the have nots and it's going to continue for a while so you know a lot of people ask that question that why does a bank need a branch and i do believe that for the next foreseeable future there is going to be a strong need for a very large bank branch network to continue to exist in india while fintechs while net only banking will continue to come up so this continues to be a part of the journey of banking in india and you have rural urban urban semi urban semi rural uh, you know at one point in time uh, many of you would have heard of sahara and peerless and they were called the rnbc they could take deposits but they could not lend so it's a kind of other form of banking where you could only take deposits from there are nbfcs which can lend money and they can issue some sort of debentures by to borrow money as well but these rnbcs were purely meant to drive thrift or savings in india at one point in time they were doing a fantastic job it is unfortunate that with a lot of middlemen and the way the whole scheme was worked out that both peerless and sahara don't exist anymore but it was a fascinating concept and similarly there was a concept of nidhis and chits which still exist in south india and there is a separate act from rbi to govern these chits and nidhis and i'm not getting into that because i'm not really an expert on that but many of these and mind you which is why india is such a large economy which thrives on thrift because there is a very strong savings economy unlike the us and many of the western uh, countries where the concept of saving is much much lower so coming back to where i started uh, you know a banking in 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 essence is a very simple job to describe that you borrow money at x percentage and you lend money at x plus delta x percentage and that's where you make the uh, difference a lot of people ask what is the future of banking and uh, would 
would a bank in the in the traditional sense continue or is it going to have a demise and i believe and i am quoting from rama vijakar burkar's book though she doesn't talk about banking she's talking about consumer india that there are so many indias which exist within india itself that there's going to be a strong need for and i'm talking about a physical branch network to continue to remain very very vibrant and a necessity for the next many many decades to come so uh, this is uh, this is a small uh, you know attempt from my side to just give an overview of what the history of banking is all about and i tried to rush through a lot of historical events because uh, you know otherwise it's, it can become a very long and boring lecture those people who are interested i refer to a, a great scholar called omyo kumar bakchi he has written some fascinating books but they are very didactic they are very scholarly works on the whole history of banking itself in india but some of you if you are really keen on understanding you might find that book in some library it may not be available online and uh, amyo kumar bakchi ak bakchi professor ak bakchi from kolkata has done some phenomenal phenomenal work and even my book on sbi i had taken a lot of references and copied extensively uh, from those books so that's a little bit of a uh, a quick understanding of the last uh, 200 years of india's uh, journey into banking and we can now suki we can uh, take the i can see a few comments popping up and maybe you can uh, help me to uh, to look at them and we'll we can talk about it sure thank you so much vikrant that was uh, uh, like everyone says a fascinating journey uh, and you've of course brought 200 years of banking into a very compact uh, uh, narrative thank you very much for that uh, i know that the i know that your research has been uh, extensive and intensive in in this area thanks to the uh, book that you've uh, written and of course a lot of compliments for how succinctly you've uh, put together uh, this journey so thank you for that i'll go through some of the questions that we have in the chat uh, yashpal wants to uh, first sharda goes on to say that uh, you know it was fascinating to hear and especially your uh, uh, anecdotes were wonderful uh, vinita compliments you as a very calm presenter something that we've known for a long time uh, and rich data that you've uh, used Yashpal wants to know that the social objectives could have been met with uh, regulations and procedures like CSR rather than uh, nationalization. Uh, of course, nationalization was a major event that changed how uh, you know uh, banks uh, worked in India. Do you have any views on that? You know what happens with CSR is that people use it as a marketing tool to go and do stuff, which is uh, a, a village close to the factory. there was a very dire need and look at uh, 1955 with imperial bank having 470 or or branches india with as i mentioned india has got 806 districts and at that point time a population of 50 or 60 crores we needed a bank which was not looking at profit alone we needed a bank which was essentially funded by the government and if you look at a multinational bank so can you worked in uh, banks earlier a bank is not going to open up a branch unless the independent branch is a profitable one and that cannot be the way a nationalized bank should work because the whole objective is not only just social in nature which doesn't mean that they making profit sbi is an extremely profitable entity but the objective is much wider you're looking at smes msmes small traders small farmers uh, you know fragmented farm holdings which need a way by which they can borrow money and if you look at even nbfcs today they don't lend to everyone and their way of understanding credit uh, uh, you know credit score is very different from the way a psc bank would look at it and that is why there was a very very strong need uh, in 1955 to create an entity like an sbi and thanks to sbi's you know ex exemplary management and you know and i didn't mention that but they started with this probationary officer concept even during the british times during the imperial bank time and even today the probationary officer of sbi is a is a very sought after uh, you know exam and to become one and that's the kind of training the sbi takes you through and which is why the bank is still run so well so coming back to the point the social objective was a very clear focus and csr would surely not meet that 
Uh, so Naveen has an interesting question after that about the cooperative banks, because as we know, there are different, you know, they're run by with different rules and, and so on. So did these exist during the British times as well, or are they a new phenomenon? No, they were the, uh, the creation at the time. And it was uh, in a lot of places, these cooperative banks were a combination of RBI and SBI working together. You also had, I didn't mention the regional rural banks, NABARD. Some of these have been creations by the RBI and by, with SBI supporting these banks because in many cases, the cooperatives were, you know, either with the sugar or uh, they could be with a specific crop. And there was a need to support those farmers or those producers. And they formed a cooperative. And unfortunately, in many cases, the RBI has not been very strong enough. And you find there were scams and the way people have lost money in cooperative banks. And now RBI has become very, very strong. But the cooperatives have been a very different sort of a journey they led through. And it requires a much stronger regulation to ensure that people don't lose money. So they were business driven rather than being uh, driven by the businesses themselves for their banking needs. Absolutely. It's like RBI doesn't allow an industry group to set up a bank. But what happens is that the trustees of the cooperative bank are very large farmers who then lend to themselves. And that creates a lot of money. Uh, Milin says that the Bandhan Bank is the latest of the large banks uh, to get banking license. Uh, uh, is it um, a small finance bank? So you have a view on that? On... You I want... think now Bandhan Bank has moved from a small finance bank to a regular bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but RBI has been extremely careful about issuing licenses. And in the last so many years, they haven't really uh, issued uh, <coughs> sorry, a license. There has been, for many years, there have been speculation about the Tatas or the Reliance and others getting into a banking. And my sense is that RBI is being prudent that they would not allow large business industrial houses to set up a bank. I think the closest example which comes to was Kotak Bank. But again, Kotak was a, more of an NBFC, Kotak Mahindra Finance Limited, becoming a bank. It was not uh, an industrial house like Reliance or a Tata's, which is then uh, starting a bank of its own. Uh, Naveen wants to know, uh, before RBI was set up, how did, uh, you know, how did the British manage the monetary policy in India? So it was the Imperial Bank, which was acting as both a bank as well as the uh, uh, a bank which could issue currency. But mind you, the uh, RBI itself was set up in 1935. So the Britishers realized that they wanted to set up a central bank, which is different from a commercial bank like Imperial Bank of India. But much before, when the presidency banks were formed, the British government had taken over the issuing of currency uh, to themselves. And then in 1935, they realized that RBI should be formed. And uh, just to mention here one small uh, aside, the earlier RBI logo had a palm tree with a lion. And then after independence, the lion was replaced with the tiger because we wanted to show our independence. And by then lions had been restricted only to Gujarat and tiger was across India. So the RBI logo has that palm tree, the coin and the, the tiger in between. SBI logo for some of you who are, uh, you know, curious about trivia. If you Google the Kakaria Lake, on Google map, you will find that it has a very close similarity to the SBI logo, which is called the keyhole logo. And one Mr. Kamath from National Institute of Design, Andhava designed the logo. A lot of people assume that, or rather presume that he took inspiration from the Kakaria Lake. That's not the case, but it'll be interesting, interesting for some of you to just do a Google map search called Kakaria Lake. And the image which comes up is so strikingly similar to the SBI logo. Oh, how interesting. Uh, Milan wants to know how do you think the digital revolution will change banking as we know today? Oh, I think th there is there is no doubt that the digital is here to stay, and I I'm sure if some of you are from the from the uh, from the finance side or from the tech side, you see how India has adopted to UPI payments in an amazing way. I mean, there are anecdotes about people coming from other countries, including ambassadors from Germany who are taken to a shop and then they see a vegetable vendor being paid money through a GP or a phone pay. It's amazing. So India's ability its with smartphones, with digital apps, with UPI payments has been exemplary. But as I have mentioned that a couple of times in my talk earlier, there is still a very, very large population which requires a physical bank. And that's going to be staying 
you know, you still find, Suki, I'm surprised to, uh, many of us are surprised when we see HDFC or an Axis Bank or, or, or an ICSA Bank opening branches even in large cities like Baroda. And the, the, the reason is because they, did, they still find a large number of customers walking into the bank branch for transacting their business. There are people like you and me who probably hasn't visited a bank branch in the last, I don't know how many, unless there is some reason to submit some document, you probably don't go to a bank branch. So there is a very interesting, and which is what Rama Bijapurka talked about it, and I'm, I'm referring to a book again, that Lilliput India, where there are multiple Indias which exist within India itself. And our adoption of digital is going to be fantastic. There, I, I'm not uh, sure if, I think there's something called a Neo Bank, which has come up in India, which is purely digital. There is no physical presence. But that's going to, the new gen or Gen Z might get attracted to it. But that's a very small percentage of 140 crore population in India. And many times we come to a lot of conclusions based on anecdotal reference which you have of our peers. And we don't represent India. We are in the top 0.5% of India's elite. And that's not India about so digital is here to stay. Digital is going to become very big. UPI payments are already becoming ubiquitous. I mean, I, I nowadays I go, the other day I came to Bombay and I realized that I'm not carrying my wallet. And luckily at the Bombay airport, I could download this app called My Aadhaar to show my Aadhaar card. Otherwise the guy was not allowing me to enter into the airport because I didn't have my Aadhaar card which was in the wallet and I left the wallet at home. But I didn't even realize that you don't need a wallet. So that's becoming the reality. But still, uh, it's going to be coming back to the bank branches. It's going to be a parallel process. With both will continue. But yes, digital India is amazing. The way usually the way smartphone penetration in India occurs, and that's going to be a huge opportunity for lenders as well as for banking. Well said, uh, Nikhil wants to know. Uh, can you refer, uh, I know you've referred to a few books already uh, and they all sound interesting, but is there a comprehensive book on the history of the major banks of India, like the Bank of India, Canara Bank, Central Bank of India, Union Bank, PNB? Uh, no, I don't think so. There are some books written on HDFC Bank. It's called HDFC Bank 1.0, 2.0. There are, uh, uh, there are uh, like Amyo Kumar Bhakti has written very extensively, but it's a very scholarly work of 800 or 1000 pages it talks about the origin of this entire concept of how macroeconomic, uh, because he's a professor of economics, he talks about the entire macroeconomic conditions and macroeconomic theory and monetary policies, of which I really don't understand in great detail. Uh, but yes, if there is a serious researcher, he should refer to A.K. Bhakti. A.K. And of course, you also talked about you also talked about Rama Bijapurkar's book, uh, Lilliput India. Yes, uh, the House of Rothschild I, I had noted on in my notes called House of Rothschild by Neil Ferguson. Uh, he's an eminent uh, historian, and that's a fascinating story. But the Rothschild itself is, I mean, a lot of people have written about it. And it continues to be a very very elusive banking family, which has exist, existed for the last uh, five or six centuries. Uh, so again, the, I think that answers Nikhil's question as well about the history of banking in India. Vinita has a question. Why do you think Mangalore has 200 plus uh, banks and many banks founded in that city itself? I think the Kamats, you know, uh, uh, the, the ex-ICICI head, many businessmen come from Mangalore as a region. Uh, to answer the question, why specifically uh, but yes, it started with Canada Bank and many other, the Manipal group, many banks, which or, many business groups which originated from there. Into, even in the hospitality, hospitality sector, you find the Kamats of the world uh, very, very popular. So they have a very strong business acumen. And which is what I feel, for example, I didn't mention, uh, although I mentioned in my, I have noted down, in Tamil Nadu, uh, near Tirunal, Tirunal Valley, there is a place called, there is a group of people called the Kaladai Kaladi Kuruchi Brahmins. And they have gone about and uh, Sundra Mayangar and Sons and many businesses uh, in South owe their origin to this small village in Tamil Nadu. The, the Natakoti Chettiars, uh, in the Chettis in Tamil Nadu, which again started this whole concept of chit funds and nidis. 
so there are sometimes these specific groups like the Baniyas of, uh, you know, some of you who are from Calcutta would know that the Marwadis, because they, they migrated from Rajasthan and then went to Calcutta because they found an opportunity that the East India Company has set up its capital there. There is an opportunity to become an agent of the officer of East India Company. They became very prosperous and rich. The Birlas and the Goenkas and the Podars and Khatris uh, all owe their origin. Though Podars Khatris are Punjabis, not uh, Marwadis, but they owe their origin to the East India Company and Calcutta. So I suppose to answer this question, it's the business acumen of some of these people from this South Canada, North, or North Canada, Mangalore area, which has led to so many banks coming up. Yeah, the Podars are uh, Marwaris. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Gaurav has a question. Uh, can you talk about the role of Indian bankers in Central Asia and Southeast Asia during medieval period? During the medieval period, uh, there was a lot of trading happening, but I unfortunately do not have much knowledge about how Indian bankers, I know about Indian bankers playing a significant role. For example, there was a Vilji Bura of, Bura of Surat, I, as I mentioned earlier, who had refused to give Shah Jahan a loan. So they were very strong Gujarati, Jain, and some of the Bengali bankers. Uh, but uh, I do not have much uh, knowledge about the medieval period Indian bankers providing uh, lending services in Southeast Asia. Vetri has a question. Who, in your opinion, are the leaders who built and transformed SPI itself into one of our best institutions? Sorry, what's the question? Who are the? Who, in your opinion, are the leaders who built and transformed State Bank of India into one of our best institutions? Oh, so there are many names. In fact, I, I talk about it in my book. One of the, uh, you know, most respected uh, chairman of SBI, Ramesh Kumar Talwar, and he became the chairman at the age of 46, which is unprecedented. And uh, so I'll, I'll mention a little bit of an anecdote there that he was removed. Uh, but, uh, and it so happened that Sanjay Gandhi wanted the SBI to lend a loan to one of his friends who had a cement company in Rajasthan. And Talwar said that it does not meet our credit criteria. So we cannot lend a loan to, we cannot give a loan to uh, this particular industry. Uh, industry. Uh, and Sanjay Gandhi was pissed off and he wanted Talwar to be removed. And he found that uh, to his surprise, SBI was formed under the SBI Act, which meant that the finance minister could not remove the chairman of the SBI. So he actually went to the parliament and got the act amended to allow the finance minister to have the powers to remove the chairman. But even after that, the finance minister did not have the courage to go and tell SBI chairman Talwar that I am sacking you. So he went and made a request saying, sir, if you can go on a long leave and indirectly then resign. And Th Talwar was one of very, one of a very, very upright officer. And this act of Rajiv of Sanjay Gandhi was called the Talwar Nikalo Act. And the, later on, you had a chairman like O.P. Bhatt, who in the uh, uh, late 80s really transformed, uh, uh, in, around 2000, transformed SBI from becoming a very staid public sector uh, bank to something which was very customer focused. And he brought about a lot of changes. Arundhati Bhattacharya is another name which comes to my mind, was the first woman chairman of, uh, chairperson of SBI. And she also played a very important role. Now she heads Salesforce in India. So these are some of the names which come up. There have been many, many uh, great uh, people. And as I mentioned, while many names may not be known, the SBI's professional officer exam still continues to be one of the most aspirational exams held in India. And that takes in a very good cream of people, graduates who come into the bank and they rise up the ranks over 30, 35 years. And they play a stellar, stellar role in why SBI is so well managed despite having 23,000 branches. It's not easy to run an institution with 25,000 branches. So Pitra says that there were a lot of policy announcements about privatization of uh, public sector banks. Any, any idea about that? Uh, are you talking about the recent policy announcements? I'm not sure. I mean, I mentioned as a part of a, my research, the, the key ones was in July 1969, which was a huge one because the 14 at one stroke, 14 banks were suddenly nationalized. And that created a lot of human cry. Even today, there are articles where people talk about, was it really necessary? But when I met Dian Ghosh, who was then the undersecretary in the finance department, who later on became the chairman of SBI itself, 
says that it was very necessary to come up with privatization of banks. And I, I feel that banks being such a sensitive area, the RBI has and needs to continue to play a very, very uh, cautious role, which is what like Madhubi Puri Booch is now doing with uh, SEBI. Because you can't allow stock markets to be run, uh, you know, and go go crazy. And SEBI is playing an important role in ensuring that they maintain certain vigilance, and which is what RBI is doing. And I think they have played a, 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 a very critical role in ensuring that they don't allow banks to misuse funds. Uh, yes, Bank is an interesting example of what happened in the last few years, but not many such examples, thankfully. Yeah, I think she meant the privatization of the uh, public banks. Um, no, I think I don't think the current government is really looking at privatizing any banks, to my knowledge. In fact, the the last private, in fact, uh, Vetri and other experts from the stock market talk about how PSUs in general are actually doing very well, and there is no talk about privatization of PSUs itself, except the last one, which was Air India, which was required. So many other PSUs now actually are in the last eight ten years had turned around and started performing very well. Keshav says that, um, so, you know, uh, you've given us such wonderful information, which some of the employees themselves may not know about the history of their uh, organizations. Uh, Shreya sums up uh, the talk very well. She says she loved the session, just the right mix of width and depth, and fascinating to see how politics and society have shaped uh, banking to be the way it is today. Uh, so enjoyed the talk uh, immensely. And so does Vinita says, glad you brought up the chet yards and the chit funds, etc. And uh, and so on. So lovely, lots of uh, compliments on on the talk. It's not easy to uh, speak without a presentation and in such an engaging and free, uh, lucid manner. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, since there are no more questions, I'm going to end the talk here. But thank you. It was a delight hosting you this evening. Thank you for everyone who attended this uh, evening on a Saturday. Thank you for joining us on Saturdays and see you all again next Saturday. Thank you, Vikram. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.